going to explore one idea in several ways. It's called the royal rulers. Very curious idea. It's contained in just one paragraph in Plato's Republic. Let me see if I can give you the problem that presents itself and how this idea of the royal rulers fits into it. I drew this very beautiful sketch here which shows someone contemplating. Now, when someone is contemplating in what can be regarded as the highest visionary state, it is said to be a transforming a transforming experience of divine luminosity. Plato says to reach this takes great toil. And my steps here are designed to lead to that state. Now, two things are possible. One can gain that state of mind because it is mind that's being experienced. And it can be episodic. It can occur quite spontaneously without any training. That happened with Burke who wrote The Cosmic Consciousness. Or it can happen to a different number of people. So this can occur once, twice, right, three times. But then through a certain kind of discipline one can enter into it again and again. And therefore, to that degree, one has learned how to enter into it by subtly responding to the highest kind of cues within oneself. So we have the occasional experiences and then someone who can get into it again and again. And then the third possibility is one can get into it and stay, remain for longer and longer periods. Now, those that can gain access to this state and therefore can learn to, to participate in, in it more freely don't want to get out. They want to stay there. That's their first reaction. Stay. Remain. And they have no interest in leaving that state. And as a consequence from that kind of exalted state, they have a kind of, they look down at the rest of us with a certain kind of pity at our miserable state. Now, <clears throat> 
What is it that brings about that highest vision? It's a training, it's a training of what Plato calls the pilot of the soul. Uh, Hindus call it the third eye. Uh, it's tra training the inner mind, sometimes called noose. Now, everyone has it, everyone has that capacity. And what happens is that it's normally we focus this mind of ours on the everyday world. And the whole art of Plato is not to put vision in the mind, it already is there. It's simply to direct it, to turn it away from this, what he calls our everyday world of becoming, sometimes called the world of appearances, and simply refocus it on itself. That's called the intelligible. That's called the intelligible. Because we are not different from reality, it's turning away from the realm of becoming and appearances to the realm of being, and that's the inner mind. Another word for this experience is being itself. and it's experienced as the most brilliant light of being. <clears throat> now, to turn from this to that takes a kind of uh, special way of detaching, see it's a detaching from this, and focusing here. It's detaching from here. Right. And it reverses, you see, it reverses, it returns. In uh, Korean and Chinese Buddhism, this is sometimes called starving, starving one's interest in the everyday world. <coughs> now, What's most interesting, you see, is that when this occurs, this is a fantastic experience of beauty itself. This is a, a magnificent vision of pure beauty. Right. Experienced personally as bliss. And the whole object of Plato's Republic is to say, don't stay in that state. Don't stay in that state. Well, I don't know many people in my neighborhood who stay in that state. It might, he must have lived in a really great time because he wrote a whole book about it hey, don't stay in that state. So evidently it must have been an interesting problem for Athenians in the fifth century. Right? Don't stay in, oh, okay, I won't stay in bliss. But this is what he's addressing. Now, why does he do this? Why not stay there? Because he has one idea that makes, I think, Plato play, makes him so unusual. And I'm going to express it in terms of the symposium for a moment. The whole symposium 
It's governed by basically a very simple analogy. Boy sees beautiful girl, love. Boy and girl get together. Conception. Girl is pregnant. One, two, three, four. Now he uses this, and he's going to develop this on another level, the level of the mind. He's saying the mind, which he calls soul, we can use the word soul, and there's a soul, it is attracted to beauty. This is where he gets in her. That's the language he uses. The getting and birth in the beautiful. He uses that expression again and again and again. Therefore, here, the whole idea is for the soul or mind to be in beauty. That's this state. He said, as a result of that, the soul, as you can see in this very beautiful picture of a pregnant soul, uh, uh, my gosh, there's a pregnant soul. There's something that must be born out of that experience. Something has to come to birth and be nurtured. See, it must be something that's coming, must be nurtured, must be developed. And the word that Plato uses to describe that birth of the soul is excellence. Aratea, that there is a certain kind of excellence that one wants to achieve, must achieve, from the experience of beauty, or one's impotent. There has to be something higher than this. Put it in the, in the creative world in the activity, in the most important creative activity, there must be something that's generated out of it. There has to be some excellence that emerges out of that. That's the whole point of Platonic thought. And it must take the form of an excellence. So this, you see, experiencing that, that is in all actuality, that's this state. To stay in that state means therefore that you are enjoying that state but nothing comes out of it, nothing emerges, there's no creative activity. This has to develop from this, one becomes involved in the need to produce, to create. That's the model. And the thing that must be created must be of a high degree of excellence. You know what that means? That means there is something greater than this. or it would be quite content to stay here. Now, one of the great dilemmas is that 
most of the great dramas deal with, and uh, human dramas deal with this. This is called romance. You want to block this, you want to block this, and you don't want to get involved in this. That is to say, people want to stay in this state. But there's got to be something that emerges from that experience. That's what Plato's saying. Don't stay there. Don't stay here. You're missing the fact that something should emerge. There should be some kind of conception that comes out of that kind of or any kind of intense relationship. There has to be something that comes out of it. Something has to emerge from it. And the key word he uses, it's not enough that there must be something born from that, but once that excellence is born, it has to be nurtured and developed. That's the way he pre presents it in the symposium. So that this is not sufficient, as magnificent and as blissful as it is. Now, the people can stay in this state only for a certain period of time. And the whole point that he makes is that this state that we're calling the conception, this state, one has to learn to endure it. There has to be some endurance. There has to be, it can't be a flitting experience. There has to be some way to stay in that for the next state to emerge. And the biggest thing is that this takes a certain degree of strength and development to endure such an extreme blissful state, whether it's here or here. So in the Republic, when he gets to this point, he said, we should never allow people to stay in this state. But we have to do everything we can to get them to come out of that state and develop that kind of excellence, to take the kind of excellence so that it can, it can be in it can be brought into the everyday world. <clears throat> That's the goal. Because he's, he brings the point that this kind of participation allows one to be so sensitive that one is said to be able to see many, many, many times better than those who haven't been involved in this kind of a pursuit. So therefore, <clears throat> in the work that we're going to look at, which is the allegory of the cave, Plato gets to the high point, he says, after you get out of the cave and get up into the, under, into the upper world and see with the upper world and experience the sun in its own place, which he, he gives a name to this, he calls this, by a Greek name, he calls it by an uh, interesting term. It stayed in the Greek, though. He calls this the idea of the good. Idea means to behold, right? This is to behold the good. This is a vision of what is called the idea of the good. Capital I, not a thought.
so what we have is a cave-like existence which people are into since their birth and they take the shadows on the wall of the cave to be their reality. They can't turn, they're fettered and they must only look ahead and the shadows that are cast by a fire upward behind them cast light and so it creates shadows because between the fire and these people who are called prisoners there's a raised wall where men carry objects on their heads and these objects on their head from the projected light causes the shadows on the wall of the cave and this is our existence we take this to be our reality what he calls the realm of appearances the whole goal then is to get out of here and take a look at the upper world right to see the upper world the way it really is it's so difficult to do that you have to first, after great difficulty, make this ascent and learn how to see in the upper world by looking at things that are visible by the night, stars, moon, objects in reflected ponds, so we can sharpen our vision. So finally, we can then see the sun during the day and all the objects that are visible to it. That's this. That's this. Now look here. It should end there, but he says, no, 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 oh no. They must now return back into the cave. They must return back into the cave and bring about that kind of excellence they've enjoyed in that upper world, and now they have to nurture it, develop it, and share it. And he has a magnificent quote, I think one of the finest quotes from Homer. He said, when you think about someone doing this, he said, he quotes from the Odyssey <clears throat> at this point, and he said, I would much prefer to be the poorest slave to a landless lord than to be the master of all the dead that lie here. I you know, I'd rather do anything than to do that, right, anything. But, right, it's his task to do that, to bring back the result of this so that this world can be infused with a higher vision. Now, this is the highest thing that can be known in this allegory of the cave. And he calls it the idea of the good. Now, I'd like to talk about that idea of the good, which is the same as this that we've described here. Now, what he says is that, look here, there's really, you're really talking about Two stories. This is the allegory. The cave in the upper world. And this is that to which it relates. So here we have the existence in the cave. And this he says, this whole realm is cave-like. He says, actually, it's like being habituated into a prison. Right? You learn to live within it. He said, this is really the world of sight. And this fire that we had drawn a moment ago, he said, you know, that's, that's firelight, that firelight, sun-like. So here, here are elements in the cave, allegory of the cave, which have certain correspondences in the world of sight. One is the sun, and the other is sun-light. And then there are the objects made visible 
by the sunlight. Now he says, by the way, the upper world is really the world of the mind. But you see, in the allegory, the highest thing in the allegory is the, in the allegory, there's the sun in the allegory. That's equivalent to what we call the there, the idea of the good. Beauty itself. Same thing. Is that's the last thing to be seen? With, to, with, with what toil to be seen? Now, he calls this idea of the good, beauty itself, he says, and he, the language he uses when he describes this is feminine. He talks about this as a she. And he said, uh, this really is really a queen. Is this really a queen? queen? This is really a queen. That's really a queen. And as the queen, it is really the origin, it's really the origin, the very source of the sun in the visible world. And the origin of sunlight in this world. That's, he's saying, this divine luminosity, he said, once experienced, you can infer what that is. Is that's the cause of the sun in the visible world and sunlight. Well, then he calls the sun in the visible world a king in the visible world, and he calls the sunlight the queen. Now, if he's got the king and the queen in the world of sight, well, <laughs> there's something lopsided. There's a king and queen. He's only got a queen in the intelligible world. Because above the intelligible world, there is the good itself. And that is the king. So you have a king and queen in the upper world, king and queen in the visible world. The queen is the very source, the creative source of both light and sunlight. And the king Right. With the queen is what is called the royal pair. Therefore, this joining of this royal couple, this joining of this royal couple in some way, she has produced these which stand as it were her children. That's the creative aspect. The whole visible world, therefore, is nothing other than the creativity implicit in this vision. It's not impotent. It's the source, therefore, of our own world and the sun and sunlight. Therefore, it's called the divine couple the divine rulers, 
or the royal rulers. Now, that's a very interesting idea. But Plato doesn't do this. What he does is he hints at it. He gives you the pieces you need to put it together. And so I'd like to read you two different translations. And you will see by looking at it in this way that he requires you to put it together. You have to make the connections. What is that like? You then have to turn and consider the whole thing and see how it fits together, right? And then you have to use the mind to see whether you can then see the connections because in seeing the connections, you are then creating links between these and using the mind in a very curious way. And what he, the name he gives to that curious way of using the mind, it's a common word, but he uses it only for this kind of work and he calls it understanding. He says, this is really understanding. Not what we call understanding in the world of sight and the things of sight. Using the mind this way, that's understanding. So let me just read you. this section, and we can have a little fun with it. And uh, after he details what we might call the geography of the allegory of the cave in the upper world by stating what's in it and how to make divisions within it. <clears throat> he says, that, um, that there is a danger, you have to realize there's a danger in bringing this kind of vision into the everyday world. And I'd like to introduce you to that so I can make the transition to this. Now, he has the person now up in the upper world, just as we described it, and now he's coming back down into the cave Then just consider, if such a one who's been living in the upper world should go down again and sit in his, on his old seat, would he not get his eyes full of darkness coming in suddenly out of the sun? Oh, very much so. And if he should have to compete with those who have been always prisoners, by laying down the law about those shadows, while he was blinking before his eyes were settled down, and it would take a long time to get used to things, wouldn't everyone laugh at him and say that he had spoiled his eyesight by going up there, and it was not worthwhile so much as to try to go up, considering his condition, would they not kill anyone who tried to release them and take them up if they could somehow lay hands on him and kill him? Yeah, they would. Pause. Then we must apply this image, my dear Glaucon, to all that we've been saying. The world of our sight is like the uh, habitation in prison. 
the firelight there to the sunlight here. Uh, the ascent and view of the upper world is the rising of the soul into the world of mind. Put it so and you'll not be far from my own surmise since uh, that's what you want to hear but God knows if it's really true. At least what appears to me is that in the world of the known last of all is the idea of the good. Oh and with what toil to be seen. And seen this, the idea of the good, must be inferred to be the cause of all right and beautiful things for all which gives birth to light and the king of light in the world of sight. That gives birth to light and the king of light in the world of sight. And in the world of mind, herself, the queen, produces truth and reason. And she must be seen by one who is to act with reason publicly and privately. So the uh, queen produces these two, gives birth to these two, and produces truth and what our translation calls reason, but that's noose. That's that part of the mind which is capable of seeing the nature of ultimate reality. So, gives birth to this, calls this the king. Therefore, if the king is the sun, the queen will be sunlight. And therefore, as he talks about the idea of the good as a her, she, the queen, herself the queen. And she herself, the queen, produces truth and reason. So she's the queen. Right? She's the queen as we've crowned her. Right? Now, he says now, that's not what you must do now is catch sight of this, the highest. He doesn't call it the king. I infer that from the structure. Right? So that you have to do some work. He calls the sun the king. He calls this the most brilliant light of being the queen, and therefore the king is married to the queen, and the sun stands to sunlight, as here the good stands to the idea of the good. Now, what does that mean? That means there's a state of mind superior to this. Vastly superior to this in the image of the king and the queen. But they together are a royal pair. What does that mean? Well, you're not going to capture it in this not going to capture it in this because both of these refer to this the idea of the good both of these then refer to this from here on so let's take it off He says, you know, there is something about the state, the idea of the good. It's not ultimate. It's not ultimate because there is something that must be born from that and nurtured and developed. There is a certain kind of excellence that must emerge from it. It takes a certain art, it takes a certain art 
to both gain a vision of this beauty itself as well as to develop and nurture this excellence that, uh, that has emerged from it. Now, <clears throat> this, is the, this is the most curious of questions. The people who experience this state throughout history, right? many, 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 most, it is inconceivable to them that can be anything higher. What can be higher than bliss? This is the experience that's called in the, in the New Testament, in chapter 9 in Mark. Right? If one is in that state, on the highest level, <clears throat> the transfiguration. Jesus goes up in the mountain and he is transfigured in this divine luminosity. Out of the divine luminosity emerges Moses and Elijah. The word they use to describe that experience is called the glory. The word in Greek is a curious word. It's a doxe which means uh, appearance, sometimes opinion, sometimes uh, presence, presence, a presence, an appearance. Because when Moses was transfigured, and it was called again the glory, God tells Moses to build the tabernacle. The tabernacle is meant to contain the presence, the presence of that experience. Therefore, the tabernacle is the presence of God. Therefore, this divine luminosity is the, is the presence or the appearance of God. It is not God, it's certainly divine. <clears throat> Therefore, it's called doxa. It's the appearance of the divine. It's the way the divine appears, the way God appears in this world through this kind of experience. It's not God. God's, that's merely the appearance of it or the presence of it, not the nature of it. That same distinction, therefore, is what we're saying stands between the good and the idea of the good. Same thing. For this is nothing other than this. Now, <clears throat> let's pull it again. Let's take a look at it again. When people experience this, they are overwhelmed by the beauty and it's inconceivable that such an experience, which is the very nature of creativity and bliss, that there can be anything higher. But, right, there is a certain excellence that develops out of that. And it has to be nurtured and developed. And what it is, turns upon the experience itself and asks a rather audacious question. What, in heaven's name, right? What could possibly be the source of that? Start with this idea. Would you agree 
anything at all that you can say is or exists, whatever you want to call it, whatever it is, there must certainly be a cause for whatever you say is. But you see, being itself, that's an interesting way of writing something that is itself, being itself, right? It's a form of the verb is. This certainly is the highest form of existence. It's called reality, ultimate reality. It's the highest expression of what is. But if we agree that you can always ask of anything that is, what is its cause? You've got yourself a rather curious problem. How can there be a cause for that? For this overwhelming and most beatific experience? Well, but wait a minute. If it is, if what is must have a cause, you're then driven. If you have that sense of excellence, and you have to nurture that question and you have to develop it to see where in heaven's name that goes. Where does it go? If you can talk about it being caused, then the cause must be greater than the thing that is produced. In what way can you talk about something causing it? Must not it also exist if it causes something? Must not it exist? Must not the cause exist? Well then look here, if there is something that can cause that's existence, it itself better not exist or you have an infinite regress. Well then, there must be some mystery then of how there can be a cause for this and yet not be a kind of cause. Well, it must be a kind of cause, but, well, okay, let's change the word cause. Whatever is the condition for that, maybe we can sneak around that word. But must that not exist? No. This is source of existence, source of everything in the visible world as the sun stands to the sunlight. And that's from the good, from the idea of the good, or this what we call beauty itself. But this has a beginning, middle, and end. It has a beginning, right. has an end, must have a middle point, well, anything that has a beginning, middle, and end is a thing that exists, state of mind that exists. So even if you can extend this, right, for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 10 years, whatever it is, it doesn't make any difference. You can still say it had it both points, a terminated, beginning. Therefore, you can talk about it as something, must have a cause or the condition for being. And that must be higher. Well, the kind of reasoning that we are going to have to develop in order to deal with that issue is called, in Plato, the dialectic. And it's by the use of a certain kind of art of reasoning called the dialectic that can then finally bring you to see that in fact there is something higher that is the cause of that. And that's going to be called the good itself. And since it's higher and the very nature of the higher is still in a relationship with the highest possible vision, then we have to explain how the good can be related to this. In what way? 
Well, you know, it's pretty interesting that when we have a royal pair, that certainly is the ruler of everything. But then we have to explain what is this relationship? What is the nature of this kind of relationship? What does that mean for the, those two to be, be, oh, you know what? Could that be another expression of what we were talking about before? In our model, remember our model? There's going to be a problem here of talking about the nature of the good itself, which goes beyond the idea of the good, which again we're calling the queen. Hats has a relationship between the royal pair. Have to talk about that as having a source. Have to talk, figure it in some way, in some language, what that combination is going to be, do, and how it means, whatever it means. Well, what I like about it is that um, the idea of the dialectic moving from the idea of the good to the good is the subject of our talk on the 27th of October. And that's what I decided to do. Give you the problem, and that's what we'll explore on the 27th. And these are the two highest possible images, if you're interested in archetypes and the function of archetypes. Right? The most creative, the way it relates. So, what would you like to ask about this strange talk? <laughs> the king, the highest. The king, the highest. So if we, if, 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 if we look at the phrase usia, being, pure being, is that ballpark for this king? Got to go above that. Higher than usia, being, pure being? See, is this it being turning being? upon itself, this turning upon itself, which we pictured before, right? right? That's still something turning upon itself. That's the very nature of being. So it's above that. So are we saying that the nature of being is something that is very staid? No. Mm. Dynamic. But we're saying that there's something higher than the nature of being. Yeah. Yeah. So the nature of being isn't staid, but there is something higher than that yes. non-staid, right. that dynamic nature of being. Mm -hmm. It's higher. And it's higher than you see it. Yes. Being pure being. Yes. Because if you see a being pure being is really still part of the queen. Mm-hmm. Well, yes, you see. Because isn't that a metanoia experience? Yes. And that's where some people want to get stuck and stay as long as they're on this planet. Yes. They go finding people who will help them yeah. be metanoic. See. The good itself can't be an experience. That has a beginning, middle, and end. What is the cause of the good? It's got to be just without. Is that that's higher than being? Mm -hmm. It isn't being eternal. Or is it yes. Then how is that higher than being? Because being is the same thing. Right. That's right. But wait a minute, maybe we're forced to, to ask what is the source of being? That's what we're doing. 
being himself. Well, like I say, what is the source of the good? The idea of the good, yeah. If whatever is, whatever you can describe, whatever you can describe is something, therefore, that exists. And you should be able to ask about anything that exists, what's the cause? Source. So does the good not exist? Must be beyond those, those, those very ideas. It's, it's unintelligible. Oh, above. Supra-intelligible. Supra-intelligible, and it can be experienced? Uh, see, the word experience means this, beginning, middle, and end. Right. So then it, it can... It's not an object of knowledge. It can be encountered. Uh, now you're getting into the better language, yes. Or recognized. See, the interesting thing about it, it has to be absolutely obvious. What does it has to be absolutely obvious. What? Whatever the good is, the good in itself, has to be absolutely obvious. And I'm supposed to wait a week to find out what the To wait. Allison. Are the two pairs that you have here, King yes. and Bob, is it analogous in its relationship? Yes. It is. Yes. It if you're saying, you is, this, is this pair, royal pair, analogous to this royal pair? Yes. So, the sun is the source. One in the yeah, world of appearances. Right. one in the world of mind and beyond. It kind of stretches, boggles the mind a bit, doesn't it? Let me give you just one nice quote about this very issue, all right? I shall, I shall do it. This, of course, comes at the end of book six. The whole analogy that we will build it later, but um, the sun provides not only the power of being seen, for things seen, but as I think you will agree also their generation, their growth, and their nurture, although it is not itself generation. Do it again, the sun. The sun provides not only the power of being seen for things seen or things visible, but as I think you will agree also their generation, their growth, and their nurture. Although it is not itself generation. It's of course not. In the same way, similarly, with things known, you will agree that the good is not only the cause of their becoming known, but the cause uh, of the state of knowledge, although the good is not a state of knowledge, but something transcending far beyond it in both dignity and power. And the interesting footnote. It's the cause, but it's the cause that they are, the cause of their state of being, although the good is not itself a state of being. That's the right translation. But the good itself is not a state of being. It's not being. 
It's beyond it in both dignity and power. So to unpack that will take a while. Does the good know that it, that it is the good? It's beyond knowledge. It has to be higher than knowledge. Higher than knowledge. Right. It is not itself a state of knowledge. It has to be beyond knowledge. Well, this is where we're going. Quite an interesting view of creativity, isn't it? The whole cosmos, the entire thing, is an outpouring of creativity. Yeah, I thought you'd like that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs> but, you know, there is one thing, though, about this. It's really astonishing for people who experience this to later discover to their astonishment that there might be something higher. I mean, just baffled. But it's something we can never totally know. baffled. It's something we can never know, though. Oh yeah, that. you can yeah, Oh yeah, you can be aware of. I don't know what you mean by know, but see, the problem with knowing is you have to have a knower, an object known, and a process of knowing. Three things. As in a gnosis. As in yeah. A yeah. Gnostic. Yeah. Right. So if this is beyond those three kinds of distinctions, you can't use that language. But many cultures who hold this to be the very highest are very much upset when someone comes along with a dialectic and points out that there's something higher than this. This is Satchitananda, being bliss in consciousness. Thank you. Thank you, guys.